Um, hello, everybody. Good evening or good afternoon from here in Leuven. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this international webinar. webinar. I feel really privileged to share some of my thoughts with you, uh, and I'm glad that we are connected in this way. There seems already to be agreement on the fact that Fratelli Tutti, the new encyclical of Pope Francis, is the third major document of his pontificate. I don't take into consideration his first encyclical, Lumen Fidei, for it is no secret that this text was mainly written by his predecessor, Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis simply finished it. Rather, the new encyclical, however, must be seen in the context of his social thinking, as expressed in both the apostolic exhortation Evangelium Gaudium on the joy of the gospel and evangelization of 2012, and the encyclical Laudato Si of 2015. Evangelium Gaudium departs from and deals with our relationship with God and reflects on the task of evangelization, which includes a social dimension, as the fourth, fourth chapter argues. Laudato Si, on its turn, starts from our relationship with creation and how this problematic relationship reflects also some distortions in our human relationship. And so now with Fratelli Tutti, um, the Pope focuses on our relationship with one another. It remains to be seen whether it's his final piece, but we could consider this triptych as Pope Francis' particular contribution to Catholic social thought. Consequently, I believe this encyclical cannot be seen in isolation from the others. In the same way we read in Evangelium Gaudium and Laudato Si about our interpersonal relationship, this means, I think, that Fratelli Tutti is not an accumulation as if it should have repeated everything that Laudato Si, for example, said about ecology. We have to read them all together. As one part of the triptych, what does this new encyclical contribute to Pope Francis' social thought and to the Catholic social teaching in general? What I want to argue here is that in light of his whole pontificate, this encyclical does not so much offer a new contribution to Catholic social teaching. Rather, it is a continuation of the renewal Pope Francis has begun from the start of his pontificate. And as is expressed in the aforementioned documents, as I will try to show. It is a very lengthy encyclical, so a lot can be said about it, but I will focus on uh, arguing this. So the encyclical continues the renewal begun by Pope Francis. This is evident from the sources which inspired him for this encyclical. As a meeting with the Greek Orthodox Patriarch Bartolomeo was the source of inspiration of Laudato Si, now for Fratelli Tutti, it was the meeting with Grand Imam Ahmad Al-Tajib and their common declaration on justice and peace which inspired him. This meeting inspired him formally hence inspired him to start writing the encyclical, but it also gave him some inspiration on its content, as we can see in the document. In line with Laudato Si, the Pope thus re-emphasizes that Catholic social teaching um, does not only has it, its own sources to respond to current situations, uh, the so-called body of social teachings, but that these reflections are also influenced by and nurtured from outside from sources outside Catholic social thought. In the same vein, it should not be overlooked that he again refers to local bishops' conferences. This implies that he valorizes the contribution of those local communities to enrich Catholic social teaching, rather than the official teaching should merely inspire those local reflections. In other words, there is a reciprocal relationship between the universal official teaching of the magisterium coming from Rome and local reflections. Put differently, not only in his arguments, but also in his method, Pope Francis remains faithful to his focus on dialogue and encounter. As a side note, there is still some work to be done here in order to let women's voices speak in this debate. In his references, nor in his enumeration of the people who inspired him, the Pope mentions women. This crit the criticism because of the title that it concerns fratelli and not fratelli e sorelli, brothers and sisters, is only symptomatic of this, 
and points to a more fundamental problem, but I will leave that aside. In terms of Compton too, it seems to be more a deepening of its typical renewal than a new contribution in terms of content. Generally speaking, because he touches on a lot of themes, the Pope describes the paradoxes we currently live in. We have the impression that we live in a more unified world, think of the globalization of economy and technology, but nothing could be further from the truth. The former globalization all too often leads to standardization and a false universalism, he says, that looks down on private cultures and lifestyles. The second, technological developments or digitalization, perhaps gives the impression that we are interconnected. But as was also referred to in the message of the Archbishop, it's an illusion of communication because here too, we limit ourselves to like-minded people who confirm our own right and thoughts instead of questioning them. And so it is more about what the Pope calls parallel monologues than a real dialogue and encounter. This turns out to be symptomatic for our time. On the one hand, the economic and technological possibilities and freedoms seem limitless. And at the same time, we build walls everywhere, virtual or not, digitally or psychologically, to protect ourselves against the barbarians, as the Pope indicates in paragraph 27, because we see the other as a danger and a threat. The result is that we lock ourselves in a nationalism that can be called a local narcissism, that we fall back on ourselves and on our own group identity. As a side note, it is remarkable that although the letter is partly situated in the context of the current pandemic, the coronavirus, it only mentions this once as a virus. The even more harmful viruses are, however, those for which we are ourselves responsible for their spread, namely those of racism and radical individualism. And I just, I'm not going to read the quotes because it would, took me too it would take me too long, but I just um, refer to them in the paragraphs. You can read them as well. But here you see that he mentions racism as a virus. And he, he mentions radical individualism as a virus today. But there is a vaccine, although the Pope does not use that word himself. We have love, whether we call it social friendship, political love, or fraternity, or maybe all of it. A love which makes us open to the other and in which the encounter is no longer merely a confrontation, but also and above all, an enrichment. Only in this way can we succeed in creating a world built on fraternity, so that as Pope Francis indicates, and I quote, God willing, after all this, we will think no longer in terms of them and those, but only us, unquote, paragraph 35. This love is expressed in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is striking how the Pope reduces all the diversity and distinctions we make in our coexistence to this one distinction, also mentioned already by the Archbishop. Either you belong to the group of bystanders who indifferently continue along their road and do nothing, or you stop. You let yourself be touched by those hurted fellow human beings and you roll up your sleeves. That is the only distinction, the criterion that matters. The decision of exclusion or inclusion, the Pope says, against which our social, political, economic and religious projects must be judged. So which side are you on is the implicit question that Pope Francis asks each of us here. Which side are we on? Which side am I on? Is the encyclical innovative in the light of the rest of the tradition of Catholic social thought? I saw my colleagues from across the globe look for the new thing in this encyclical. I'm not convinced that it is so new. In my opinion, the contribution of the encyclical lies not so much in its innovative character, but mainly in the continuation of its renewal of Catholic social thought, and, it in, and also in its deepening of his understanding of this thought. The Pope undoubtedly makes choices, stresses what the focus should be. 
Often, Catholic social teaching tends to be so nuanced about certain issues that the ambivalence remains. Comfort the critique that everyone can read anything in these documents, as long as you stress particular paragraphs and leave out others. Pope Francis, however, clarifies a number of issues where for him the choice is unambiguous. And I'm just going to give you four examples to show this. First, the question of the role of private property. Whereas Catholic social thought strikes a balance between the importance of private property for personal well-being and personal development on the one hand, and the common good or its social function on the other hand, commitment to the good life for all, Pope Francis radically chooses the latter. The universal destiny of goods, uh, and hence the principle that God has destined the earth so that all may enjoy it and flourish is primary. With remarkable quotes from the church fathers, he clarifies his vision. In paragraph 119, he writes, St. John Chrysostom summarizes it in this way, not to share our wealth with the poor is to rob them and take away their livelihood. The richest we possess are not our own, but theirs as well. In the words of St. Gregory the Great, when we provide the needy with their basic needs, we are giving them what belongs to them not to us. Hence a focus on the social function of private property and of the universal destination of goods. A second example where he's unambiguous about is on the legitimacy of war. Although Pope Francis does not radically question the legitimacy of the just war theory in general, he does wonder whether currently Considering the harmful and destructive character of nuclear weapons, the situation does still legitimize the reference to just war theory. In other words, the circumstances have changed in such a way that the reference to the notion of just war seems inapplicable and unjustified. And we see that in this quote, where he writes, we can no longer think of a war as a solution because it, its risk will probably always be greater than its supposed benefits. In view of this, it's very difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to sustain of the possibility of a just war. Never again war. Second example. A third example, example where he makes an unambiguous choice is the question of the relationship between neighbor love, charity, and justice. While in the 1960s, 1970s, Catholic social teaching was clear that neighbor love serves as a motivation for the commitment to justice. During the pontificate of John Paul II and certainly Pope Benedict XVI, some ambiguity has arisen as to what prevails, charity or justice. Should we not rather give priority to charity as combating the symptoms rather than to justice, which aims to tackle the structural causes of poverty, of inequality, etc.? Pope Francis confirms the vision he expressed on the subject earlier. The universal social and political love that our world needs is expressed in a commitment to both, but also to justice. Hence, he aligns himself to the Catholic social teaching of the 1970s, which had a stronger justice discourse. And this is a quote, a very long one. Um, I'm not going to read it completely, but it's interesting because he makes the distinction here between treating the symptoms and tackling the causes. For example, uh, in the midst of the quote, he, st he starts giving this example of, um, it's an act of charity to assist someone suffering, but it's also an act of charity, even if, if we do not know that person, to work to change the social conditions that caused his or her suffering. And then the example comes, if someone helps an elderly person cross a river, that's a fine act of charity, okay? The politician, on the other hand, builds a bridge, and that's also an act of charity. But tackling these more structural cause, causes uh, is an act of justice. So both go together. Last example where I think he's unambiguous is on the public role of the church. It must be public, going beyond mere preaching and charitable praxis. More than once, the Pope hints that our faith must be given substance in everyday reality and thus in our actions. 
Moreover, it's an action that supports the construction of a more just and peaceful society. Hence this quote. And it was also referred to by His Eminence, the Archbishop. Uh, the, the church, while respecting the autonomy of political life, does not restrict her mission to the private sphere. And further on, he continues, neither can they renounce the political dimension of life itself, which involves a constructive attention to the common good and a concern for integral development. To conclude, viewed from the perspective of Catholic social thought, the analysis that love can be public and political, even more so should be public and political, may not seem so new. Just like his analysis that we have already come a long way with freedom and equality, but still fall short if we do not take fraternity into account. Because without fraternity, we will never be more than just living side by side, separated from each other, without belonging. How equal and just it may become. Also, France's attention to what this means in terms of migration, that hospitality and human dignity are primary over the rights and interests of nations, for instance. And also what he thinks on politics with a view to carrying out analysis and taking measures for the most vulnerable is not really surprising, given the rest of the tradition of Catholic social thought in general and his pontificate in particular. However, taken from our present time and its social and political climate, characterized by what the Pope uh, defines as populism and neoliberalism, first time a Pope mentioned these tendencies, it sounds like a welcome relief, the encyclical, as does the hopeful perspective of Fratelli, Fratelli Tutti. For despite the black cloud out, uh, over our closed world, the message is ultimately, ultimately joyful and positive, also typically Franciscan in several meanings of the word. Because we believe in and entrust ourselves to God who works in the world, inside and outside the boundaries of the church and in the hearts of people, thus driving them towards good, towards a better future. Thank you.